Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MIT Robotics Seminar. Um, today is the first seminar of, uh, of the spring semester. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Russ Tedrick. Uh, Russ is the Toyota Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Aeronautics and Astronautics and Mechanical Engineering at MIT. He's also the Vice President of Robotics Research at the Toyota Research Institute. And uh, he did his undergrad in computer engineering at the University of Michigan. After that, he got his PhD from ECS at MIT, and he did a postdoc um, still at MIT in brain and cognitive sciences. So uh, Russ has provided many pioneering contributions to robotics, uh, spanning multiple fields. He was doing planning, nonlinear control, perception, dexterous manipulation, locomotion, and so on. And he's been really able to span all sorts of platforms, from flying robots to humanoids. Um, something that I really like of uh, Rust's research is um, the rigor of his papers and also the um, essentially effort in bridging, bridging theoretical guarantees with systems that really work in the real world, which is, I think, is the right way to do for, uh, for robotics. Uh, he's teaching great courses at MIT. I'm sure many of you are aware, but uh, uh, if you're not aware of these courses, check out Underactuated Robotics and Manipulation. These are uh, courses many of my students are taking and are enjoying a lot. So definitely, like, you know, um, uh, great courses to be aware of. Uh, goes without saying, Russ has received many awards and accolades for his research and teaching. I'm not going to mention the entire list, but uh, let me mention, like, you know, 2023 MIT Teaching with Digital Technology Award, uh, 2021 Jamison Teaching Award, the DARPA Young Faculty Award in Mathematics, uh, 2012 Ruth and Joel Spira Teaching Award, was named Microsoft Research New Faculty Fellow, and of course he got multiple best papers at top robotics conferences, including uh, ICRA and RSS. So it's a true pleasure to have him kick off this semester robotics seminar, so without further ado, let's welcome Russ. That was an awesome introduction, thank you, Luca. Okay, thanks for coming. Um, if you know me, you might have heard me say GCS sometime in the last uh, year or so. Uh, so uh, I have a goal today of helping you understand why I'm so excited about GCS, graphs of convex sets. But I also feel I have kind of a duty. Um, you know, the foundation models are coming. They're coming fast. They're awesome. Uh, and it's going to change a lot of things. So I kind of have a, feel like I have a duty of telling you why I'm going to give a talk about planning in the age of foundation models. OK, so um, I don't know how many of you have met Boyuan. Is he? I saw him come, come in here, yeah? Oh, there he is. OK, good. <laughs> if you have met Boyuan, you might have, might have um, had a similar conversation to me. But this is roughly how an average day in the robot locomotion group goes these days, right? They, Russ, how are we going to solve robotics today, right? And he's serious. I mean, he's extremely passionate about this. And I think um, that's a tough question to ask for a, to a PI, right? Like, that's a there's a lot of pressure on me to come up with an answer that's good enough to, to you know. Um, but it is an exciting time in the field, right? I mean, uh, we are asking big questions. We're talking about intelligence and like what it means to be intelligent in ways that we've never talked about before. And, and I think maybe we're on the cusp of really useful robots in domains that weren't possible before. OK, so how do I, I'm not going to tell you how to solve robotics. I don't quite know that. But I'm going to tell you, um, you know, why planning still matters. How about that? Um, let's think about some of the recent success stories, and not, even not so recent, right? But AlphaGo is, a, is a, still a favorite for me. Uh, did we solve Go? I don't know. I, I think we mostly, you know, if I was like the Toyota professor of Go in 2016, I probably would have been some, doing some soul searching, right? That, that was like a pretty solid solution to the problem of Go, right? And let's just reflect on like how that went, right? So the first step, not even AlphaGo zero, let's start with AlphaGo was to do behavior cloning, imitation learning, to learn a lot from human expert demonstrations that were online, right? Lots and lots of moves of, from expert players online. And then, of course, the, the next big step was to, to do RL and to, to improve, right? So they had a policy network. They had a value network. They did Monte Carlo tree search. And they constantly strengthened the um, original behavior cloning uh, policy to the point where AlphaGo Zero was just dropping the human demonstrations and going from scratch. OK, so maybe you, you, you know that story. <clears throat> um, what's beautiful about that story is that it's it maybe to, to this day still one of the best examples, I think, of how learning and planning get along, 
right? They are not at odds in any way, right? So um, you could argue maybe that these are two aspects of intelligence, and I think either one alone seems sort of insufficient to me, right? So if I'm doing planning through contact of a dexterous hand, I should not solve the problem as if I have never planned on the dexterous hand every time I wake up in the morning, right? I should clearly bring previous experience to bear to cut through the massive complexity of that problem space. So learning clearly should inform planning. But I think it goes the other way around, too. I mean, even the most ardent supporters of, of um, LLMs, right, will still say it's a little annoying that they can't create new knowledge, right? There's a limit. We've read everything on the internet. Are we done? Are we saturating? Right? I think there's a goal of constantly improving, and maybe we haven't fully got intelligence until we have both components, the ability to generate new knowledge and the ability to consume and learn across a massive uh, set of knowledge. So the learning should guide the planning and allow us to explore only the high scoring actions, right? And the planning should speed up the learning by, uh, by having rollouts that are highly informative and, and cover maybe more than just what the original policy would have covered. There's another, there's a slightly nuanced version of that, right, which is that I think if you just take the behavior clone policy and you just add some planning on top, then even without any additional learning, the planning immediately strengthens the policy. Just by virtue of just looking ahead a few steps before you make your decision, you're immediately stronger. Okay, so and if we're carrying a, a, a policy into an open world setting and asking for zero shot performance, I think it very much might be the case that doing a little bit of planning online could take a, our best policy, no matter how good it is, and make it that much stronger, okay? <clears throat> so does that recipe work for robotics, right? Um, behavior cloning is starting to work, right? Big time, right? You guys know where this is going. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to talk as much about diffusion policy today because uh, there was a great talk by Ben and Siwan uh, last, uh, last December in the EI seminar about the diffusion policy work that's happening at Toyota, in collaboration with Sharon's group, has been really, really rewarding. Uh, so just a very quick reminder of this. So instead of watching a lot of expert Go players, uh, we are now giving demonstrations through a teleop interface. Uh, this is just a simple example to sort of showcase the idea of pushing a T into a, into a known location. Okay, and then from that uh, set of demonstrations, we're learning, we're doing behavior cloning. The new thing, of course, is bringing diffusion into this. So what diffusion looks like in a trajectory space is you start with a random possible trajectory and you denoise it down into a very coherent trajectory and you get these beautiful motions out. Okay, so uh, what's new there, right? So that's, this is learning a distribution, um, you know, the score function over actions, right? Uh, it's learning the, the gradient of the, of the score function, right? And, uh, <clears throat> It, and it deals well with multimodal demonstrations. So in the T-pushing, that was carefully chosen because there's a symmetry there that needs to be broken. Sometimes you move left around the T, sometimes you move right around the T in order to, to take the action. And if you're not careful, a lot of our continuous-based uh, behavior cloning beforehand would kind of go right up the middle. Now, learning distributions has worked for a long time in categorical distributions, right? If you had to, to have a discrete set of actions, learning a probability over a discrete set of actions, that's worked for a long time. Um, and people have had ways that we've learned distributions over continuous actions, but that's, I think, really where diffusion came in and helped a lot, is now we have um, you know, a richer formulation for reliably learning uh, high-dimensional continuous trajectories, right? Okay, so behavior cloning is starting to work. Um, you know, we, we have incredible rollouts of skills. We, we give demonstrations, 50 to 100, maybe 200 if it's an important uh, skill. And we can, we can watch our robots play out these like, incredibly dexterous, uh, with simple hands, but dexterous motions of complicated tasks. Uh, I always like to tr throw in like one maybe you haven't seen before, right? So uh, we can fold shirts. There's, there's hundreds of skills coming up on thousands of skills we've trained. And uh, I think a lot of things that you can do with a two-finger gripper, we've done with diffusion policy at this point. Okay, so these are coming. This is, you know, the, the large behavior models or embodied foundation models or visual language action models, they're coming, right? TRI calls them large behavior models. And it's super exciting. It's gonna change a lot of things. And of course, there's the, the work at Google, there's work at Meta, um, 
There's Octo is the open source, the academic version. Okay, so these are coming. All right, so let's say we've got that as a backbone. Step one works. That's a little ambitious, but let's just say step one works, okay? Then step two is, is self-play with Monte Carlo Tree Search or something equivalent. So what are the tools we draw from in robotics, right? So we have sampling-based planning, we have trajectory optimization, um, but they're still weak. Uh, and I say this from a place of like, I tried to, I've been working on this for 20 years, so I'm just blaming myself. I'm not criticizing the field, I'm saying, you know, we haven't done a good enough job. Our planners, especially when you're planning through contact, are still very weak. They can't play the same role yet, reliably planning through contact, for instance, in order to guide a search. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put that in the critical path as a guaranteed thing. Um, okay, so let's look back at AlphaGo and how that extended, right? So Go and Shogi and Chess fell pretty quickly. Then they moved on to StarCraft, okay? It's interesting. When the transition to StarCraft was a big one, that was a doozy, right? That went from discrete things to high dimensional continuous action spaces. And the Monte Carlo tree search kind of fell out of the way and became just you know, the more naive exploration from PPO. So I feel like we, we're still in missing that MCTS for robotics, right? Somehow that, we don't quite have that. And I worry that we lost something there, right? So we can do that PPO thing, but it's, it's expensive. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter if it's offline. But for this like online inference and strengthening the planner with a, you know, strengthening the policy with an online planner, we don't have that. We don't have that power. Okay, so I also have to apologize that I, I'm gonna do planning with Newtonian mechanics, which is, makes me sound old. Right, but, um, but that's good. So, because I don't fear the sim to real gap. And it's a, there's a slightly nuanced story about that, right? So, first of all, of course, you know, I care about simulation and I'm happy with the progress we've been making in simulation. I think um, a carefully designed simulation shows incredible uh, matches to reality. But of course, we've also seen lots of, of success from domain randomization where you can train in sim and deploy in real. So, that's all good. You'd expect me to say that. Maybe what you didn't expect me to say, or well, less people have, are talking about, but I think is the most important case actually, is that the simulation just doesn't have to be perfect. I'm not necessarily gonna play this train and sim deploy in real game. The new thing is to co-train in sim and real, okay, and admit that there's a gap, but that's okay. We're gonna play the transfer learning bet, right? So um, let's just think about the robot data diet, okay, and the transfer learning bet. Right, so the best data we can possibly get in this setting is robot teleop. So, you know, Eric or somebody uh, is giving demonstrations that run through the robot you care about. Actually, these are the actions, the exact perception to action maps that are exactly what you need for your robot and your task, okay? That's the best stuff you can get. The other extreme, of course, we have YouTube. We have um, lots of humans doing lots of interesting things on YouTube, right? We should be able to leverage that. The advantage of YouTube is that there's lots of it, okay? But the embodiment is, gap is big. So we have to, if we're gonna learn something from YouTube, we have to come, overcome this, this transfer learning bet, okay? The robot teleop data is in scarce supply, right? It's whatever we can generate on the real robot, but we don't have any transfer. And this is a whole spectrum, right? Okay, so, and there's lots of entries on that spectrum, so ego exo and all the ego 4D and everything before that is somewhere on that spectrum where it's more curated um, version of, of YouTube kind of data. You can use robot data from other people's robots and admit that there's a, an embodiment gap, okay? Um, so that's not as good as you, on your robot, but still useful, right? Okay, simulation lives somewhere on that spectrum. If you co-train, the same way you might co-train with, uh, let's say, OpenX embodiment and your robot data to try to do better on your robot data, as long as the simulation is informing you enough about, you know, it, that it's learning some, putting pressure on relevant parts of your feature space, then you should still generate data in simulation and co-train with it in order to get your real robot to work better. Okay, so we don't have to simulate everything that the real robot has to do. We have to simulate enough to generate data that puts pressure on the representations to learn something about physics. That's the hope, okay? So that's a long way to say it's okay that I'm using Newtonian mechanics today, okay? And there's other entries in here. This is actually, we just came out with, uh, the, today, um, we just announced this thing with a new collaboration with Sharon. Uh, it's just awesome, these, these handheld grippers, okay, that you can just pull out of a bag, and you don't have to be a robot. You can just carry it around, and, and the robot hand 
looks like the real robot hand, so you can just transfer that immediately to the robot. It's called the universal robot manipulation, universal manipulation interface, and the skills that uh, Chung was able to do with that is, are just out of this world good. So that, he posted that on Twitter like two hours ago, so I thought I should put it in. Okay, so, um, so let's just make that point one last time just to sort of summarize, right? So I think the first foundation models that we're gonna have for manipulation, I, the goal, my goal at least for that is to be generalists, right? We wanna have the ability that you can type any natural language command in, you show the robot what it sees in front of it that it's maybe never seen before, and it's, it's not gonna be a, the most expert manipulator. It's gonna do something reasonable, okay? And I think because of that, having some online planning to strengthen or specialize the generalist policy, certainly while we're getting off the ground, is, could be very, very important. Right? So I think planning and learning really work together, and they should forever. Uh, I think planning is a, is a potentially essential component for robot intelligence, and there's still lots of room for improvement. And, uh, and even planning and simulation can help us speed that pipeline, deepen our understanding, which is big for me, okay, and ultimately lead to better, faster progress. Okay, so that's why you should care about graphs of convex sets, okay? In addition to the awesome results I'm hope to hope to show you in a minute. Okay, so I'm gonna, the, the graph of convex sets story started with two papers that were, uh, one was a very much a, a math, uh, mathematical optimization paper, okay, in SciMOpt, and, uh, and, and the other one is a robotics paper, okay, on, on taking graphs of convex sets and using them for motion planning. And I wanna tell you that story and tell you, I'm gonna stay a little bit at the level of how would you frame new problems, the robotic problems you care about, into a GCS kind of problem, graph of convex sets problem. And I put everybody's picture here, but I really wanna highlight Tobias, um, I'm gonna put up individual new contributors on each slide, but Tobias kind of there on all of them. And I just, I didn't put him on every single slide, but he's uh, been a driving force in this, this push. GCS 101, why do we wanna think about graphs of convex sets, okay? So my, my basic setup is that there are really two aspects of the motion planning problem, and this comes from having thought about it for a long time and really you know, thinking a lot about dynamics, thinking a lot about contact, thinking about a lot about collision-free motion planning, okay? Um, I think we've been conflating two aspects of the motion problem in a lot of our methods. There is a combinatorial problem. You have to decide if you're doing collision-free motion planning, if you're a point robot that goes from the start to the goal, you do have to decide, are you gonna go left or right around the, the red obstacle, okay? But then there's also this sort of smooth optimization over continuous curves. If you have dynamics, nonlinear dynamics, you have to obey the, the laws of, of, of physics, all these things, okay? And a lot of times we lump those two together, and the story today is gonna to be pulling those two apart and trying to make it, the, that separation explicit, okay? So how do we normally address the combinatorial problem? Oftentimes we do that with sampling these days, and that is powerful, okay? So this is my standard sort of Initial to the goal, probabilistic roadmap. I'm gonna pick some samples, draw a roadmap, and then I can make a plan, okay? Now, <clears throat> this picture is good, but I, the thing that I find uh, frustrating about the picture is that uh, the knowledge you have, the checks you've made on your environment are limited to points and the line segments connecting them. So there's sort of no room left to deal with uh, optimization, first of all, but to, if you had to deal with continuous dynamic constraints, that's very hard. If you had to think about uncertainty or robustness, that's very hard. You have a very point narrow view of the world, okay? You can try to build those things in, but it's, it's a kind of a forced marriage with sampling. Sampling's about talking about, the, the strength of sampling is that you can evaluate things only at a point. But some aspects of our robotics problems need to think more broadly about the, dynam the neighboring dynamics. Okay, so then when you look at the continuous dynamics, a lot of times um, some of the best methods we've seen for, for doing that part have been trajectory optimization. So when you see, once you decide in this particular optimization, once you decide the order and timing of your, rough timing of your footsteps, then you can fill in the details of all the continuous optimization, handling the dynamic constraints using trajectory optimization. And the goal should be to put these together, okay? GCS helps us put these together. And it looks like this. So for the first time, we can do things like plan a quad rotor through a maze, solving the motion planning problem, but also taking into account all the dynamic constraints, okay? And we're doing that with a convex optimization formulation. So a trajectory optimization that's solved very reliably to global optimality. Okay, we can play Twister with bimanual robots that have to put mugs on shelves, 
Okay, this is a high dimensional configuration space, two seven DOF robots, okay, um, that are planned jointly. It's not plan one arm and then use the, that one arm as an obstacle for the other one. These are planned jointly and you can get into the nooks and crannies in order to make that happen. Okay, and it works on real robots. This has even got a little aspect of multimodal motion planning because it plans when to pick up the mug and what order, you know, what, all these timings, okay. Um, this was one of the earlier sort of examples of that. David is awesome. He's got GCS running on spot, okay. He can plan these beautiful motions in the full dimensionality of spot. Okay, and as I'll tell you in some, a little bit of detail today, the, um, we now have it working for planning through contact. Okay, so we've got only simple um, hardware examples of it so far, but the framework I think has got, uh, got teeth. Cool, so let me tell you how that works. So this is the, um, the trajectory optimization part of GCS. So let's, I'll motivate it directly from this picture again. So what did I say I didn't like about this was that I have a, only a very narrow sort of view of the dynamics. When I sample, I think about the, 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 uh, the obstacles here and maybe on the line segment at some dense sampling, okay? So how can I do better than that? How can I combine some of the strengths of sampling with some of the strengths of trajectory optimization? Well, here's a proposal. So every time you draw a sample, let's do a little bit of extra work and grow a region, okay? Offline, in the first case. Offline, I'm gonna grow a region around that point and guarantee that that region is collision free, right? And then, now I have, where, where I, in the PRM case, the probabilistic roadmap, I had a roadmap of points, vertices, connected by line segments. In the GCS case, I'm gonna have a roadmap of convex sets, okay, vertices, which are the vertices in the graph, okay, of continuous curves connected by continuity constraints. Basically, I'm giving myself enough, enough freedom to, be, to leave room for optimization, leave room for dynamics, for uncertainty, for all these other things to work, okay? But otherwise, it can work in pretty complicated problems. I mean, if we can do that set generation, then it has some of the power and some of the completeness kind of results of a sample-based planner. So how does it work, right? So there's um, a couple pieces to tell you. The first one is just the, the actual GCS algorithm itself. It's an efficient algorithm for solving short pro uh, short, shortest path problems on the graph of convex sets. Okay, and then there's the transcription of the trajectory optimization problem into the GCS. To make that work, I have to tell you how I made those regions. Okay, that's called iris. We talk about a, a approximate convex decomposition of configuration space. And then we talk about um, the right way to, to parameterize continuous curves to make convex sets that describe continuous curves that satisfy all of our constraints. And that together makes GCS trajectory optimization. Okay. Graph of convex sets, super simple. I'm telling you mostly about the robotics applications, but it's actually very general. It's not specific to robotics. We all know how to do shortest path on a graph, okay? If I have a, a bunch of vertices and a directed graph, and maybe a weighted directed graph, and I wanna find a short path between the start and the source and the target, okay? We know lots of ways to do that. Uh, GCS, graph of convex sets, generalizes that slightly, I think in a very natural way, and one that gives strong uh, algorithms. Every time you visit the vertex in the, in the graph, you're allowed to pick one element out of a convex set. That's the generalization, okay? So, so you're allowed to make um, you know, continuous families of parameters here. Visiting means you get to pick one element out of that set. And then you're allowed to make the edge length a convex function of the, um, of the distance between those points that were selected, okay? And then what matters is that that turns out to be a problem that we can solve really well. Okay, two things, I guess. We can write a lot of interesting problems into that format, and we can solve instances of that problem extremely well, okay? Now, I emphasize throughout the talk, you'll hear convex, convex, convex. I actually don't think the world is only convex, um, but, but we've done the convex case first. It, it, actually, we've got some ongoing work trying to, to show you how you can do the nonlinear optimization versions of this. It still benefits from GCS. Okay, but the clarity of thinking that happens and the, and the strength of the results uh, is, I think, most powerful in the convex case. Okay, so take a problem like finding a, a path through the, you know, do trajectory optimization for finding a, a path through a maze, right? You have a start and a goal. Now, as a graph search problem, that looks trivial. That's, I could just make that into a graph and that's like a simple 
TCS problem. They're a computer science problem, right? But if I say, no, I have to make a quadrotor fly through a maze, then that suddenly feels very daunting. Like, uh, how am I going to make a trajectory optimization fly through a, a maze? OK, and we haven't had good solutions for that before. OK, but when we formulate these kind of problems in, a, in the graph of convex machinery, we can solve very complicated trajectory optimization problems using convex optimization. When I first saw that, I was like, I didn't think convex optimization could do that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. OK. Now that we understand it, it's clear why it, it works. It's not a mystery, OK? But it, it opens up a new set of possibilities for what you can do with, with strong optimizers, OK? And you could write a mixed integer version of this before, but it just you wouldn't have, because it would have been completely intractable and requiring a dramatic number of binary variables. OK, and then you can change the, so this is now continuous curves hiding in the, in the, ma in the maze, OK? You can change the objective function. You have minimum distance, minimum time. You get different solutions. Interestingly, we had to kind of poke holes through the walls in the maze because mazes typically only have one solution. That's kind of boring. So we had to make it more interesting by, by poking some extra holes. OK, so, so GCS is, a, is actually a mixed integer convex program in general, OK? But um, it has a tight convex relaxation. So in practice, we rarely solve the mixed integer version of the problem, only if we just want to certify our results were good, OK? Um, but basically, you can, if you want to, solve the global optimality with branch and bound. And it's orders of magnitude faster than previous work because of that tight convex relaxation. But in practice, solving the convex optimization and doing a little bit of rounding um, almost always sufficient to obtain the globally optimal solution. Okay, so when you can, if you can write your problem in this graph of convex sets abstraction, I think a very natural abstraction, then you can call these solvers and you will hopefully get a very good result. Okay, so next step, how do we get the regions? Okay, so. Um, some of you remember Robin Dietz, and we did a lot of work back in the day, even on Atlas footstep planning, trying to figure out how to make um, steppable regions in dense visual terrain. Okay, and, and Robin came up with this algorithm called IRIS, which was a fast, fast approximate convex segmentation algorithm. And we have been generalizing that uh, over the, the recent years to work in configuration space instead of just in task space. And there's a couple versions of that. You'll hear us talking about iris nonlinear programming and C iris, which is using sums of squares, gives rigorous certificates. Alex, who's here, did a lot of work on that. OK, so um, what I want to impress on you, though, is actually I, a lot of people are afraid of the convex decomposition. It's, it is a little daunting, but it works really well. OK, so you can make the, 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 the metric that I would say that, that makes me say it, it works very well is that um, you can find big regions of configuration space that are super useful and get right up close to the object. You would, like, how, how useful could a convex region in configuration space with a hand picking up a mug be? This is just sort of a random walk through some high dimensional polytope, convex polytope in, uh, in configuration space. And it goes right up around the mug and back and out and whatever. So, so we can actually capture super meaningful parts of the configuration space with these convex decomposition algorithms. Okay. Originally, we started by just saying, OK, pick a point, like I, the recipe I gave you, pick a point at random, grow a region, pick a new point in random, uh, rejection sample, but if you find a new point, grow a region. And that, that works, but it's pretty inefficient in its coverage. And uh, we've got some new algorithms now that are trying to explicitly try to optimize the convex cover of the space. So if you have a toy configuration space here, um, the key idea there is to uh, first, just do a sampling-based a visibility graph, OK? So any, any two nodes that can see each other with a straight line, we're going to draw an edge between them. OK, that's called the visibility graph, even if they're far away. So it's a little different than a PRM, but, but similar, OK? And then it turns out, so the notion of a clique in a graph, they're neighbors that can all see each other, right? That is almost corresponds to a convex set in the original space. OK, so it turns out if you can quickly find cliques in the visibility graph, that's a good hammer for figuring out where, the, where you should put your convex sets. And Pete and Alex have done a nice job now of sort of making uh, almost turnkey convex decomposition algorithms for configuration space. So we now try to uh, approximately solve a minimum clique cover on the visibility graph and then iterate to overcome some of the gaps in the almost there. Okay, so. 
just to make, a, make that pictorial for a second. So if you make a low enough degree of freedom configuration space that you can animate it or draw it, Pete is amazing with these visualizations. Okay, so this in the, in the interior of that hull is the, is the collision-free space for that set of robots. Okay, and we now have, like we, you expect to see for convex uh, decomposition of a, of a 3D geometry, but this is on the configuration space, you get these beautiful approximations, efficient covers of the, of the internal space. And those become sets in the GCS. Okay, so now we have these sort of sets in configuration space. How do we actually write the optimization problem? Okay, the blue sets are the places you want to visit. You're inside them, okay. The red sets are the obstacles. So first of all, any two sets that overlap or are even touching each other get an edge, actually a, a, in both directions in, the, in our graph, okay, that's easy. And then we're gonna embed, we're not gonna just pick one point every time we visit it, one point in the configuration space. We're gonna actually make the sets in the GCS problem uh, lifted, a higher dimensional version of that set. So we're gonna embed a number of points in that same set to describe a Bezier curve inside that set, okay? And then we're gonna add constraints to the optimization saying at optimality, on the optimal path, the, you know, the end point of this trajectory, if this edge is in the graph, one to three is in the graph, then the end point of this trajectory must begin the beginning point of that trajectory. And those are exactly the kind of like equality constraints that sampling-based planners have a hard time doing, but we can do beautifully with optimization, okay? So if you want to have derivative continuity, all these things are possible now uh, as just equality constraints, for instance, in your optimization. And then we do a little extra work, actually a lot of extra work, but uh, for, a bit, for the gain of being able to do time rescaling automatically inside the um, optimization. It's actually beautiful. So, so we've done trajectory optimization for years. This is one of the things I've always disliked about trajectory optimization is that you have to pick ahead of time how many samples in your trajectory optimizer, right? I'm gonna pick 100 points, I'm gonna optimize over them. Maybe you stretch and shrink. This, the, the length of the trajectory, the, the resolution of the trajectory falls out of the optimization. The sample based planners have done that forever, but we didn't have that in trajectory optimization. And trajectory optimization was worse for it because um, it, was it was breaking the optimization landscape by putting sort of this weird constraint that you can't drop points. I think the problems are much better now. So the basic claim in the original paper was that we have, with GCS, if you're willing to pre-compute those, those sets, um, then online you can find better plans, you know, that, that get to the goal faster, whatever your metric is, trajectory length, okay? And you can often find them faster because we're solving these convex optimizations and then a little bit of rounding than, let's say, a PRM, optimized PRM, or a, a PRM with shortcutting for, for more performance. And the cool thing is that you know, some, sometimes the graph preprocessing, which can be very simple, can actually make the optimization super fast. It can just kind of figure out there's no way you should go in these other distant locations. Um, and the optimization becomes simple and good. It seems like there's about a you know, six minutes or something like that. I should, I should dial up something to say, yeah. So what is the size of the graphs for the runtime? Yep, um, for, it's, 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 you're right, so that, I, that is not qualified on this slide. Um, ten, tens of, of regions cover a huge part of, of state space, okay? And, uh, but they are, yeah, you, don't, you only need tens of regions to cover like m most of the regions you, you talk to, you get to. Okay, so, so GCS trajectory optimization by itself is kind of transitioning from basic research to real use cases. There's a lot more work to do, but we're actually trying to push this out. It's in Drake. It's, um, you know, pretty mature implementations. If you bang on it, you might break it. We'll fix it. That's kind of it's kind of fun to, um, you know, to push this out and make and get people actually using it. So, for instance, Dexi Robotics is I missed the thing. So Dexi is a local company. We had a, a project with them. They're doing food preparation, right? So they make salad bowls and things like this with robots, and um, you know, so they switched from their pretty optimized. This is like time is money for for these guys. Um, PRM-based planner, now they're using GCS in production, and they were pretty happy with how that worked, right? In a setting where you're willing to sort of, you're gonna be making plans all day long, you're willing to pre-compute once, it makes a lot of sense. I think it just really clobbers that problem. 
we're doing the same kind of thing in the, in the lab. So um, uh, Rohan's got a, a nice uh, setup doing sort of a, a similar pick and place clutter clearing all day long. And we're just going to start hammering on this and trying to make sure the solve times are small and the trajectories are always beautiful. Uh, this came up like last night. So thank you for, for pushing on that. Lots of interesting extensions I can tell you about. So Tommy's been thinking about how to make these things plan on manifolds. So you need to plan on manifolds if you're a mobile manipulator and you have to live in SO2 with your mobile base. And we've got extensions of this thinking about geodesic convexity that you know, do the right thing. So if I showed you the full version of this part of the talk, you'd see PR2 sometimes with the other guy's planner you know, going around like this. And with GCS uh, you know, handled the right way, it, it does the right thing even in sort of the complex configuration space. Okay, similarly, we can have continuous rotational joints. If you could just saw off the joint limits on the lower link of the EWA and you needed to go around all day long, we have beautiful solutions for that now. We're going to try to get uh, Tomas using this soon. And we promised him he's gonna, that we're going to have it on Movo soon. OK. Tommy's also been thinking with Shruti about, uh, about the constraints that you'd have if you have some nonlinear equality constraint. If we're planning in configurations space, then the task space constraint of keeping your hands together for a bimanual manipulation uh, becomes a, a hard constraint, a non-convex constraint. That was him showing that there was a, a big iris region, but now we can do planning using analytical IK to sort of uh, handle the, the nonlinearity. Uh, it's sort of a, it's a beautiful result of a sort of doing GCS regions on a manifold in order to obey these kind of end effector constraints. Okay, if the promise was only collision-free motion planning, I wouldn't be as excited as I am excited. Okay, but I think um, it is it's useful. I mean, if you're if you're in a logistics company, that's a good thing to have. Okay, but um, beyond collision-free motion planning. Uh, one of the things I've been thinking about for a long time is planning through contact, okay? And Bernard's been leading this, this charge. So how does that work, okay? So um, let's think about Chung's simple example. Actually, when Chung was spending the summer at TRI uh, working on this, he came up to me one day and he said, Russ, so it's kind of annoying to give the teleop demonstrations of this task. Can you give me a planner that will just solve that problem? And I was like, no, I've been working on it for a long time, but I don't have a planner that can solve that, that reliably, right? Uh, but now we do. Now we can go back and uh, it took me a, a year longer than he wanted, but, uh, but we have the solution now. And similarly, for the kind of uh, uh, motions that we've seen from Alberto's lab, some of the beautiful motions, he, his focus in this with Neil was about uh, the feedback control and the estimation of the friction cones and things like this. But the planning part of that, uh, we can now do very, very nicely with, with GCS. So how do we plan for tasks like that? Okay. Um, if you've taken under actuated or if you're taking under actuated, you'll see this picture of why is planning through contact hard is because you get these hybrid systems. The contact molds can change the dynamics. I'm, we're refining this picture a little bit. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it in a minute, okay? Uh, and, but that contact uh, breakdown sort of gives a natural combinatorial structure that you could embed in a graph of convex sets. Okay, so have one vertex for each contact mode. That's kind of the starting idea. We'll tell you what happened, okay. Um, and then you simultaneously search for the mode sequence and the continuous motion, right? GCS is, in fact, that was actually one of the, the biggest things that motivated the whole project. So let's take that T-pushing example. Um, we're gonna use quasi-static dynamics just because that's sufficient um, and it's a little simpler. I don't think it's fundamental that we, we need it. Uh, we re didn't worry about the impact dynamics itself, but uh, just the dynamics of being or in contact or not, okay? And then we're gonna make a plan over the object poses, contact forces, contact locations. So unlike the collision-free motion planning, this has now got dynamics inside it and nonlinear kinematics from the rotations. So how do you put that in a convex set? Rotations in particular have always been, and, and you get force cross distance. You know, these are things that don't fit nicely into convex optimization, right? So you get these, torque balance equations that have um, these Jacobians. They, you have SO2 constraints, but you also have force times distance kind of constraints. So um, we've known for a long time that you can write that as a QCQP, quadratically constrained quadratic program. All, all the terms enter in an ugly non-convex way, but they are bilinear at least, okay? Force times distance, things like that. 
And um, we tried before, like, like when um, Hung Kai was here, if you guys remember Hung Kai, we were hammering on trying to do semi-definite relaxations of contact. Never quite got it. Um, this time we got it. We, I think we just tried a little harder. We figured out uh, we maybe had talked to Pablo more. Uh, we had you know, a new fresh eyes uh, working on this, and, and we've broken through. Now we have very good semi-definite relaxations of those kind of problems. Okay, so um, there is a standard relaxation of the QCQP into a semi-definite program. Maybe if you've taken Pablo's class, you might have, you might have seen that exactly. Okay, there's a, a few additional uh, things that we've done to to leverage additional information that we know about SO2 that's not captured just in the QCQP. Okay, but if you take this philosophy of adding a bunch of strengthening constraints to make the convex relaxation stronger, then you can get very good things to come out. Okay, now. A little bit of jargon here, but the, the feasible set of a semi-definite program is a spectrohedron, okay? So a spectrohedron is a convex set. Semi-definite programming is a, is a convex optimization. So now, it, and they are even kind of beautiful, right? They have these sort of interesting shapes, okay? In, uh, if you find the only one you can draw in 3D, right? But um, <clears throat> uh, so now these are gonna become the sets in our GCS. We're going to live, our spectrohedron is going to be the set in our GCS, okay? So we're going to build a graph of these spectrohedrons, one for each contact mode, and then we're going to solve the whole thing with GCS, things like shortest path problems. We're, we now have tight convex relaxations of, of, of some of the dynamics of contact. They're not perfect. The, the, the dynamics are actually non-convex, okay? Um, but the convex relaxation doesn't have to be perfect, right? It just has to be strong enough to help you know which path to take through the graph. And then you can clean things up with a little bit of nonlinear optimization, right? But if it solves the hard part of the problem, deciding whether to pick something up, whether to push from one side or push from the other side, that's the hard, that's been the blocker in the, convex, in the planning through contact case, right? So for instance, just deciding to push one way or push another way, okay? This is the hard part of the problem. If the convex relaxation is strong enough just to help you make that decision, okay, then the details you can fill in later. That's not the hard part. We can, we can just clean that up. Okay, so, um, so now, you know, a little bit too late for Chung's project. Uh, we have beautiful sort of global solutions to the planning through contact of the T pusher and other similar planar pushing. Okay, and Xiao has been putting this on the, the real robot. Beautiful, we've seen T pushing, or we've seen uh, you know planning, planar pushing plenty of times before, but the machinery here is uh, is not limited in any way to that sort of uh, formulation. Okay, so naturally, um, you can take those trajectories and load them into a diffusion policy. Okay, Adam's done that. Adam nicely did this for me like last night. So, thank you for that. Um, all right, so. You don't have to explicitly cross the embodiment gap. You can use this as part of, you know, this is like a curriculum for our co-training, right, where we can generate lots of physically interesting behaviors in simulation, and that becomes, yeah, part of the curriculum. Okay, you can do things like Alberto's planning through contact. Right, we get beautiful solutions for that kind of problem, too. All right, so... In that setting, like, like I said, we started by saying the combinatorial aspect of, of the problem is uh, the contact modes, the contact graph. We said that for a long time, and there's a lot of papers you can find out where people talk about using contact graphs, okay? And that's close to right. That is a source of the hardness, but it's not quite right. It's a little bit more subtle than that. Because in fact, like Terry's done beautiful work recently talking about randomized smoothing with Peng. I think I saw Peng, yeah, Peng's here too, yeah. Um, you know, you can actually soften the contact, the making and breaking contact a little bit. The dynamics of actually making and breaking contact, that's not the hard part, actually. Um, you, can, there, you, know, you have continuous solutions to differential equations that can have no contact and then contact. That's not where the discontinuities and the combinatorial complexity comes from. It's more about, am I contacting on this side or am I contacting on this side? Am I picking up the object at all or not picking up the object at all? Okay, so, so we're actually even working now to relax the complementarity constraints in the convex optimization, okay? But, but the, the decomposition of the configuration space combined with this contact is somehow giving us the right combinatorial breakdown of the problem. 
these algorithms aren't arbitrary. It's, um, I, wanna, I really want to sort of emphasize that. So um, it's not like we're like, oh, let's try this, and let's try this, let's try this. It's, it's more like there is a computational object that we have written down. It was given to us by Newton, OK? It has a particular structure. It has a convex optimization. It, it, it has a convex hull in the, uh, in the original decision variable. Sometimes we try to change decision variables to make that better. OK, and the, the name of the game is to think hard and come up with the most efficient approximation of the convex hull of that, of that set. It is not throwing darts at the wall. It is a you know, deeper and deeper understanding of the fundamental problem that makes these things better and better. And that is just so rewarding to be able to just say, OK, ah, we got that one. Now it's better. You know, ah, we figured out that one because we thought really hard about it. And we got that one. Now it's better. OK? Um, it's also, so you know, if you've, to, to say, contrast it with RL, for instance, RL, I think, is doing incredibly well, can solve many of these problems, although it's hard to know if RL is strong enough to, if you were to just generate random environments and try to solve, you know, a lot of times there's some cost function tuning in the middle, OK? That is uh, because RL is, is still a weak optimizer, right? The, the gradient descent sort of step in RL is still weak in some sense. It's incredible how well it's, it's gone, but it's still somehow weak. It, in this case, we're trying to write down exactly the cost function we want. Minimum distance from here to here, okay, plus maybe plus a minimum energy, keep your forces small. No tuning, right? And then you use a stronger optimizer to just always get these solutions, right? It's a very different place to be. Okay, one, one last idea to throw in. Um, it turns out, so I've talked mostly about planning, but I want to also just talk about feedback policies, okay? So, so far, we solved an optimization for every initial condition. The plan was, you know, you're in a new place, you want to get to a new place, solve your optimization problem. But what if you had a slightly bigger optimization you could solve once offline, which solved for all initial conditions? It was a policy instead of a plan, okay? It turns out we were already doing that. We didn't even realize we were kind of already doing that, but there's, there's a generalization of this, okay? So um, if I take your GCS problem, flip it on its side, Okay, and you just understand the dual solution. If you just look at the LP solution of shortest path on a graph, the old one before GCS, we've always known that the dual solution, the dual variables correspond to the cost to go on the graph. So when you solve the shortest path, you're actually also solving for the cost to go. What does the dual look like in the GCS? Well, it looks like a piecewise affine lower bound on the, on the value function. When you solve a GCS problem, you're actually solving for a lower bound on the value function for all the sets, OK? And now you say, OK, well, that's interesting. What if we made the dual a quadratic function or a polynomial function? Then it becomes a sums of squares, OK? All of these things that we've done over the years sort of connect in here. And you can get tighter and tighter approximations of the value function from below using convex optimization, OK? And then, actually, Sava gave a group meeting for us like an hour ago. And, he, and it turns out you can even give relatively weak lower bounds Combine it with a little online search and get incredibly strong players, if you will. Uh, and you can also just sort of solve like from many different initial conditions to the goal. So the, this is just saying I've got a lot of possible initial conditions. I solved one optimization problem. And then no matter where you started, it'll find a collision-free trajectory to the down to the goal region. Even more interesting, and I wish I had time to tell you the full story. It turns out if you take that, so we went from a piecewise affine value function to a piecewise quadratic value function, you move that back to the primal, and you ask, what does it look like there? And it turns out it looks like you're pushing distribution, probability distributions through the graph. Okay, And higher order moments here become higher, higher order polynomials in the value function correspond to higher order moments of, the, of being pushed through the graph. So you can actually do planning under uncertainty in that way, too. So if you wanted to, for instance, say, I've got a little bit of uncertainty, that's a natural way to avoid running into the, you know, Collision-free motion planning, especially optimizing one, tends to hug your obstacles. But if you just do a little bit of reasoning under uncertainty, you can get around that. OK, I'm going to skip ahead. But let me just say that you can do things like task and motion planning, too. We had a particular version of it where we were moving a lot of boxes around. And instead of calling it, it turns out the, the sort of the insight from that was um, instead of solving a shortest path problem on a graph, you actually wanted to solve a, a different combinatorial problem. You wanted to walk along the permutahedron in order to get to the, the goal, because the order of the boxes didn't matter. 
Okay, but there's a different network flow problem. That was the right combinatorial problem. It has a different convex geometry. It's the permutahedron. Okay, but there's a GCS extension for most of these problems. Okay, so how are we doing here? So we got behavior cloning um, was step one for AlphaGo. And then we had this sort of self-play. And the big question, right, is, is GCS strong enough to, to, to become the MC missing MCTS for our robotics problems? I'm willing to try, right? OK. Um, GCS separates combinatorial discrete optimization. It's given us some of the stronger, strongest planners I've ever had, often solves hard problems to global optimality, and there's a lot more headroom for progress. And I think learning and planning should work in harmony. And I'll just close by saying that. <laughs> Sorry for the technical dif difficulties. Amazing talk. Yeah. Right. So we have time for a few questions. Let's see if anybody wants to start. So I'm, I'm curious. <clears throat> Um, tell me a little more about impact. You ignore impact during manipulation. Yep. Can you talk a little about that? Yep. Um, I don't think that's uh, I don't think that's a fundamental thing. If you so the standard way we handle impact in simulators, for instance, and in most of our models is by these time stepping methods. So you could do a explicit impact. You've got a delta of force and whatever. Those would be a little bit harder to fit into this framework. But if you're willing to do the time-stepping approximation, then um, you know so that becomes a, 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 a time-averaged impulse of force over a, over a fixed interval, then that should snap right in. That just becomes that that fits right into the sort of linear complementarity formulations of contact, and I think that should go through. It's just we kept the velocity small here, and it was a complexity we didn't need for those instances. But when we start getting more dynamic, we need to put those back in. Yeah. Um, so what's the best solution now when we have a problem where the free space is like changing as we're executing the plan? So for example, we want to pull like an object out of clutter and maybe like just doing one shot of the free space decomposition at the beginning is in insufficient? Yep. Great question. So so uh, everything I told you about is like pre-computing. So if you have objects that are you're going to pick up and move around, there's, uh, okay, there's an easy thing which is... Uh, an easy answer, but not a great answer computationally, would be to just include that, the, that in your configuration space, right? But then that configuration space gets big. So we've been playing um, games like um, uh, you can very quickly trim a region in or right before you pick it up by just considering collisions from that one region to all the other regions. So you have a, an initial cover, convex cover, and you prune it a little bit with runtime constraints. That's a partial answer. But I think actually when you're in much more dynamic environments, the answer is going to just change completely. I think um, we're probably going to be going directly from perception into, uh, into approximate regions, right? I think the, the example we're talked about so far was optimized for the case where you're, let's say, a logistics company and you're moving all day long in the same thing. And that brings one set of answers where you really want to be, you know, time is money. You're like at the edge of performance. Let's get it right. I think there's a very different answer where I'm a mobile manipulator that's moving around. I want to not run into things, but I'm not trying to be time optimal or something like this. And then the, I think very fast, very approximate covers that can come directly from perception are going to do really well. That's my guess. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, a lot of robotics application has uh, temporal logic constraints, which have a lot of uh, Recursive computation. So, do you think that the uh, CGS framework could convex or like create a graph of convex sets in which I'm gonna preserve these recursive constraints that are highly non-convex? Great question. So, um, I think the right answer to that is that there's a there's a wealth of knowledge in graph community and network flows. Okay, um, if you can write. So if you take your whatever problem you're thinking about um, and think about shrinking your sets to a point, and that gives you some sort of existing network flow, okay? Um, if we have a good convex formulation for that network flow, 
then the GCS extension of that flow, which will allow you to now add continuous variables, is likely to work pretty well. Okay, so traveling salesman is still NP hard. We have approximations for it. We're not going to do better than the approximations, but we hope to bring continuous elements that are almost as strong as the network flow problem. So given a new topology problem, I would ask what's the right way to cast that into a network flow? Ask how strong are the network flows? Some of them are just NP hard and I'm not going to help with that, right? But some of them are going to have beautiful relaxations and now we can bring that to the continuous space. I, Oswin's waiting for... Thanks for a great talk. Um, so you started the talk talking about like, I guess, learning and then we transitioned to GCS and planning. Um, and you've talked about like how sort of learning and planning should work together. I can see how we might use, for example, GCS and planning to generate data for learning. But where's the piece where sort of like we can use learning to help planning? Because I guess, as I see it um, right now, the, the learning in GCS happened through like the PG students learning from like, you know, prior work. But like, <laughs> um, I'm not really sure how, or how, how would you see like, um, no, taking sort of learned. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, but it's uh, I think it's got a simple answer. So the um, the limitations of what I'm talking about so far is if you take a hard complex uh, planning through contact problem, like put a dexterous hand or something, uh, then the size of the graph is going to just explode, right? I can't even put it in memory, right? Uh, if you have a strong, a reasonably strong generalist policy and you roll that out a handful of times, that tells you what nodes in the graph to visit. It gives you a very small graph, just like the Monte Carlo tree search kind of algorithm, and then you do GCS over that. Or you, you might not even need to do it. Maybe you just, once, if a path is known through the graph, then you just have a convex optimization problem right off the bat. And now you can bring, so I think two things, the thinking about the GCS abstraction, um, you know, normally when you roll out in a high dimensional continuous space, lots of rollouts, you're gonna roll out a lot of similar trajectories. <laughs> The, the explicit representation here will tell us to explore more things more efficiently. Like once you've visited this path through the graph, you don't need to look at that one again. Spend your resolution on different ones, okay? And for every path through the graph, now it's just a convex optimization problem. So I get a small, you know, I don't have to solve the massive dexterous hand problem out of the box because I'm bringing a policy to help. So I have a quick question for sure. the GCS part. You mentioned that <clears throat> many of the relaxations are tight, some are not. <clears throat> do you get a sense about you know which problems like you know are tighter than others? Do you, yep. do you understand which ones are breaking? Yeah, yeah. I, I think we have a. Um, it's a great question. So so yeah, So uh, I think we have a pretty good understanding of of what makes it tight when it's when it's not tight. Um, in the shortest path version of the problem, we have some explicit examples that. I mean, basically, symmetries in the graph are a natural thing that kills you, right? So if you can, if it's the same cost to go this way or this way, then you might try to go straight up the middle. That's a that's a I classic see. example. Okay. Um, typically, there's ways to write that better, right? Uh, but I think we understand for so there was a yeah there was a case in the UAVs where where it was taking a longer path around and flying through the door when we thought for sure it should fly through a window. Okay. And it turned out it was because there was two windows that were basically, you know, uh, almost exactly the same cost in this, and it was splitting probabilities. But we've done we've done a lot of things to round better and, and make that work better. <laughs> because I guess the follow-up question is, can you do the convex decomposition like you know, in a way that is making the relaxation as tight as possible? Although if the symmetry is kind of an intrinsic problem, probably it's not that simple to make it go away. I think you're right that there's an interplay. So for instance, when we put in dynamic constraints and we want to make a a convex approximation of nonlinear dynamics, right? You could pay a, you could make smaller regions. The dynamics change less over that region. You might get a tighter set, right. or you pay, you know. So I think there is a trade-off in those, and you can you can move the work from the convex optimization into the discrete problem, and vice versa. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm curious about the end of this talk. You mentioned. Uh, about being able to plan under some amount of uncertainty with probability distributions. And I think this sort of goes to the question of unstructured unknown dynamics a little bit, but what is exactly the, or what do you think are the limits of how much uncertainty you can handle in these models right now? I'm curious both from like a symmetry real perspective, but also just new new environments and generalization. Great. Okay, so in terms of new environments, I'd be thinking about that as a curriculum um, you know, where I, I give you demonstrations from rollouts from different environments. I'm not going to try to make a convex approximation of like, you know, things with different numbers of objects or different size state spaces. Um, but 
I mean, maybe the, sim the, the optimistic, simple way to say it is I think the things you can do with like linear robust control, which are very powerful, you can suck those in to the, a lot of these formulations, okay? So think about, you know, local reasoning about robustness, the same way LQR plus stabilization works incredibly well, you know, locally, right? Inside these sets, you can bring in a lot of those concepts of robustness that we've, we know and love. If you, take, if you take the SOS version, you can make them bigger or whatever, but that's the kind of uncertainty that we capture locally. And then the graph, the fact that you can now propagate different ways through the graph captures a sort of a different level, like shortest, stochastic shortest path. I think the total modeling power of that is still to be determined, but I think I'm optimistic. I think there's a lot of things we know that, that come in. Nice. That makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Russ, for the great talk. So purposefully taking a more controversial view, you okay. know, and going with the example of, you know, how in Go first people were doing behavior cloning, yep. and then eventually they started doing more MCTS and more RL. Yep. So would you say that, you know, so should we skip the phase of doing behavior cloning in robotics and just directly, you know, try doing the better version of RL? I, uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a natural question given the setup, right? But um, uh, I think dexterous hands are harder than Go, you know. I, so like I'm, I'm willing to bring anything I can to the table. If we nail that and it's like too easy, sure, let's take away the behavior cloning step. I'm not there yet. I think we'd have to bring every possible tool, and I think BC from demonstrations is is like an obvious tool to bring to the table, right? I th I don't think we can solve dexterous hands with GCS as it is. The graph gets too big. I need help. Something from you know, I think PPO can solve it, right? You know, so there's there's that conversation, but uh, uh, I don't think I'm not I'm not ready to leave that on the table yet. Right, good. I think we're going to stop here. Enough grilling for us, but thank it's you so good. much for being patient. Okay. Any many questions. And folks, just remember there's some extra food in the back. And I will close just by saying thanks to our sponsors supporting the seminar this semester. Um, Symbotic, uh, Skydio, and Meta. Uh, thank you. <laughs>